So, meine Damen und Herren, damit starten wir in die Session 1. So, we are now starting with Session 1, implementation of the European Fiscal Governance Framework. Let me remind you of the rules, and the first speaker is Professor Neil Stigerson, Chair of the European Fiscal Board. Professor, you have the floor. Herr Kopf und Herr Kaas, thank you very much for the honor of uh, organizing this conference and inviting me to it. Um, it's an extraordinary honor, and the facilities in this splendid uh, room are such that I think we can forget the Hofburg for a few more years before you open your premises again. Uh, it's a pleasure also to speak to this large and impressive uh, audience. Um, the Intergovernmental uh, Parliamentary Conference on Stability, Economic Coordination and Governance is just like the European Fiscal Board, which I have the honor to chair, a product of a long series of efforts to improve the framework of economic policy uh, in the European Union, particularly fiscal policy, of course, which has been going forward for almost three decades since economic and monetary union was designed. I'm not offending you, I hope, by saying that both uh, your conference and the European Fiscal Board remain some distance from direct policy making. Article 13 of the uh, uh, Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance refers to your regular meetings, and I quote, uh, intended to discuss budgetary policies and other issues uh, covered by the treaty, end of quotation. The EFB is an independent advisory body to monitor the Commission's implementation of surveillance and to advise on reforms of fiscal governance and rules. So the task in both cases is uh, central to the economic pillar of economic and monetary union, but it is also informal. Of course, for national parliamentarians, there is a major consolation that you have an influence on the national policies. But as a forum uh, of uh, international or European dimension, I think the comparison is not unfair. While monetary policy and the institution that is in charge of that, the European Central Bank, they have remained more or less well-defined uh, as regards the substance and governance. Of course, there are refinements and innovations. But the perception of how other economic policies, including not least fiscal policy, should operate has been subject to major change and controversy ever since the start. And when the Maastricht Treaty was signed 30 years ago almost, um, fiscal policy had damaged its earlier credentials as a way of stabilizing the economy. And often during the 70s and the 80s, fiscal policy had added to rather than dampened economic cycles. And over that period, public debt had doubled from 30 to 60 percent, more or less, of collective uh, gross national income in the member states. So it was not unnatural for the treaty to focus strongly on long-term sustainability, retaining public finances in good order for the long term through a ceiling on the deficit and a norm for the debt ratio, the well-known 3 and 60 percent that we still have in the treaty. Most of the reforms of the uh, Stability and Growth Pact, which has been the operational basis for uh, the uh, Maastricht Treaty, uh, can be seen as effort to recognize that policy should also, fiscal policy should also contribute to economic stabilization while it observes long-term sustainability. After the major tightening of the rules and clarification of them in the aftermath of the crisis 10 years ago, uh, and introducing new decentralized element of surveillance through the fiscal compact, not least through the National Fiscal Councils, uh, from which we shall hear later in the session, the original one-dimensionality of the fiscal rules has been supplemented by looking also at the need to sustain a hesitant recovery 
uh, from the low point of 2013. Uh, recent uh, initiatives taken by the Commission, which has the authority to do that, um, has as a basis two questions. When you add up all the recommendations that are addressed to member states one by one, do we get an aggregate outcome which is broadly satisfactory and also takes into account the balance with monetary policy? And secondly, how can this trade-off that I mentioned before between sustaining an econo uh, economic recovery without undermining sustainability be best reflected in the national fiscal policies? These are the two central questions still for EMU. And the former asks more or less uh, whether an aggregate perspective, overall perspective on the euro area or the European Union for that matter, should at times modify national policies because they become too restrictive, these recommendations, or too generous. Uh, the latter point uh, retains the national perspective but asks how fiscal rules with some discretion, some flexibility, can allow for the trade-off. This conference, largely of uh, national parliamentarians, may be mostly interested in the second question about strictly the national perspective. But my presentation today shall focus primarily starting on the first and the so-called Euro area overall fiscal stance. The latest report produced by the European Fiscal Board in June uh, 2018 dealt with this issue to review the general orientation of fiscal policy in all countries. That is a highly uh, topical subject, uh, sorry, for to the economic policy for 2019, and that is a highly topical subject, of course, given, as you will know better than anyone, uh, that preparations are now at a late stage in preparing these budgets for 2019, not least in the national parliaments. They will be presented to the Commission and be the basis for discussion between the Commission and countries uh, in mid-October. But obviously an aggregate perspective on the whole Euro area must not uh, <coughs> overlook differences in national positions. The Euro area is far from being a homogeneous area the recent performance has fortunately been more homogeneous than the past. Yes, it is on the screen, thank you very much. We're now coming to the section where I do need some slides and some graphs uh, to explain uh, what uh, the theme is about. Main, my main message can be summarized really in two points. Uh, um, the Euro area is enjoying a broad-based economic expansion. That has been uh, very clear since 2017, more or less, uh, now for almost two years. And current economic conditions should therefore offer some opportunity for creating fiscal buffers. Uh, there's a need at the current time to avoid past mistakes when good times were wasted. And if that opportunity is missed, the euro area will be more vulnerable when the next shock hits. It's not possible to put a date on that, but most economists, I think, would recognize that uh, a couple of years from now, we are unlikely to have quite as propitious international conditions, certainly, as we currently do. There's no need of a, for a radical shift of fiscal stance, but we need to think more carefully about whether to move from the neutrality of fiscal policy that we have seen in uh, some of the past years uh, to a stance which is a bit more cautious and restrictive. And that applies, of course, particularly to high debt countries that need to improve their structural positions to maintain sustainability. Implementation of a stability and growth pact looked at nationally, summing up what is said to each country, would in fact yield an overall stance of that nature in 2019. That is not all because uh, national framework is not uh, sufficient. The EU fiscal framework also, in our view, needs to be strengthened. An effective stabilization function should be combined with stronger and simpler fiscal rules. Now, while these topics are recognized as important uh, at the official level of governments, uh, the Eurogroup, etc., uh, they are not really being addressed. Uh, they are being delayed until uh, two or three years hence. Uh, maybe not because they're not interesting or urgent, but because they're simply too difficult. But let me add a few uh, more points uh, through the slides. Uh, 
You will note that uh, your area GDP has expanded faster than expected. Um, every year since uh, 2016, there have been upward revisions to the growth forecast of the European Commission. Smaller with time, but very large for, in fact, 2018. And what is sometimes overlooked is at the time when the Commission makes revisions for the growth prospects for next year, the level from which that growth starts is also revised upwards. So if we look at 2018, for example, uh, the level estimated for the GDP of the euro area in this year is about two to two and a half percent higher than was expected in 2016. Quite a remarkable uh, improvement. And that continues into 2019, but at a slower uh, pace. Uh, there's been some softening in 2018, uh, but I come back to 2019 where the outlook remains still uh, quite strong. If you think some of these uh, measures are too general, let's look at unemployment, which is back to the levels uh, pre-crisis, still high, you would say very high, uh, 8% uh, on average, of course covering large differences between countries. Um, and uh, the out so-called output gap, which is intended to measure the slack in our economies, is uh, back to uh, about zero, it is in fact moving into positive territory. That is, we are producing above capacity, permanent capacity levels at the best possible estimates in 2018 already. So this uh, graph illustrates more clearly that we are climbing above potential uh, in this period. That is not the precise optimism of the European Commission. It is shared by other international institutions such as the IMF, the OECD, and also those uh, researchers who uh, uh, calculate carefully what the lasting effects of the crisis, financial crisis, have been uh, in dragging down uh, output. Let me skip uh, the next graph to save uh, some time. Good times are underestimated when they occur. That is the theme of that. You will see that there's a pessimism in built uh, cautious forecasts, they are usually turn out to be better uh, GDP in, uh, uh, in real time uh, than uh, the forecast. But let me go to the next uh, uh, graph. And that is the, the other side of the message I want to convey, that the good times are not being used very well. This graph may look a bit complicated, but if you focus on the last two years, 2018 and 19, of course both are forecast at the present time. The blue is uh, an expression of the change in, in policy, and the fact that uh, this blue element is below the zero line means that there's a deterioration of the so-called underlying or structural budgets in 2018 and 19, both years of nearly one half percent every year. And that in 2019 will almost exactly offset the beneficial effects of higher growth and the savings that still occur on exceptionally low interest rates. So we have a situation where, the, uh, of course, the automatic effects of the upswing improve public finances, but they are used, that uh, room is used to spend more uh, or give uh, tax uh, eases, and that is uh, a dangerous uh, element in, in from you of sustainability. Particularly when, the next figure may be too complicated, but let me take, skip directly to uh, 2019 again. Some people have said uh, 2019 is, is too uncertain. We don't really know, and isn't there a lot of risk uh, out there? Um, you will see that the uh, uh, forecast for 2019 are still close to 2%. They have been revised downward slightly by the ECB. The Commission has still stuck to 2% growth for 2019. So uh, this is still clearly above the uh, estimated level of growth of capacity in our economies. That might not be worrisome uh, if it was not the case that the freedom of action has been used primarily by countries that are marked here in this latest graph in red. The figures in red are those that have the most serious problems of debt sustainability of long-term risks to their uh, financial uh, position. Uh, Italy, France, Portugal, in particular Belgium. Uh, the green ones are those that have no problem really of sustainability. The yellow ones are those in an intermediate position. There are several indicators of uh, 
their sustainability. But it is a worrisome sign that uh, the countries in red uh, all are well at, uh, also at, uh, have eliminated the output gap, they're using their resources, but they are still uh, running an expansionary policy and spending more uh, at this time. Um, so we are not making good use of the good times. And uh, finally, let me turn to uh, uh, the uh, element of also the European initiatives that are underway. You will have seen that last year there was a proposal from the Commission on for uh, central stabilization function. It has become a little bit more concrete, uh, looking into the scope of having a modest sum in the budget for 2021 to 27. The purpose of such a function, ultimately, when it is uh, built into large size, would be to address symmetric and asymmetric shocks. It would be based also on independent judgments. And access to it, that is crucial, both in the view of the Commission and I think of other observers, on compliance with the fiscal rules. But the problem with the fiscal rules is, as we can see from the recent experience, that the rules have become very complicated. They re retained their flexibility at a time when flexibility was not required nearly as much as in the past. They have become intransparent. There's therefore a need to simplify and streamline these uh, rules. And that is crucial also for the uh, discussion of a common stabilization function because in order to uh, trigger that stabilization function, one needs to have good performance relative to the national rules. So that is uh, the basic uh, message that uh, there's interaction between these two elements, the national and the European, and these questions should be addressed. And I hope they will be addressed, uh, if not by uh, the Commission and the Council, uh, then uh, through uh, national actions in, in various countries, and by the interaction of the national parliaments, maybe, and the uh, fiscal councils, from which we shall now hear from the Austrian case. With Professor Harbour, I think, next. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Tiggerson, for your uh, presentation. I'd like to hand over to Professor Harbour, professor at the uh, Danube University of Krems and vice president of the Austrian uh, Fiscal Board. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I would like to focus on uh, some of the aspects concerning the implementation of a fiscal uh, policy framework for the EU. So aside from the uh, macroeconomic indicators and the description of the fiscal stance, I would like to um, introduce some talking points into the discussion uh, concerning the economic policy and uh, concerning the fiscal policy um, strategic elements. So um, we'll start with the presentation here. Thank you very much. Uh, main questions I want to tackle will be should the EU and the EMU fiscal framework be strengthened in order to achieve better control of the common fiscal orientation? What are the main challenges? The second uh, topic, as uh, pointed out in the uh, preparation for your sessions here, will be if there is a common fiscal capacity, uh, is it appropriate and is it a viable instrument uh, for deepening the European Monetary Union and the European Union as well? What conditions should such an instrument uh, have? Because I think uh, from the point of the interparliamentary uh, discussions, it will be very interesting on how to find such a working framework which leaves on the one hand enough room for national governments and uh, the national parliaments in uh, decision making and on the other hand in um, giving enough uh, strict and clear cut framework and orientation for doing that job. The third topic will be uh, in, in what way could we simplify the framework? To be honest on that, uh, our day-to-day -day business in the Austrian uh, Fiscal Advisory Board uh, is to calculate, to analyze the fiscal stance, fiscal policy, uh, to assess measures. As you know, the independent fiscal councils have uh, uh, basically two important functions. They have 
some kind of advisory function and they have some kind of watchdog function, which is also very important. And um, we see from, from the daily business that uh, the framework has been improved in many ways, but there's still room for more improvement uh, for especially, as uh, Professor Tigerson pointed out, simplification and uh, increasing flexibility and effectiveness, but not at the cost of being more unclear or at the cost of being, uh, let's say, not strict enough. Yeah? The fourth topic, um, I will just present a few thoughts on that to give you some stuff for, for the discussion, will be what is the role of the national parliaments in, in, in those um, um, framework um, uh, changes and how could the national parliament uh, monitoring and uh, supervisory powers be strengthened in that context because I think that's also um, at the, at the uh, main point, one of the main points uh, you want to go. Okay, so let's go to the question of strengthening the fiscal framework. I see two most important uh, aspects uh, with respect to that, uh, especially the importance of a sound fiscal stance. As my colleague Professor Tigerson pointed out, it's um, some kind of balancing the present and the future. So there is need for a sound fiscal stance and for some kind of um, anti-cyclical uh, policy orientation, especially concerning public debt and public deficits. And um, as we saw from, from past periods, of course it's always hard without a binding and clear-cut framework to stick to those rules because it's some kind of game theory. Uh, national policymakers, national parliaments uh, are always inclined in being, uh, let's say, uh, expansive, in, in, in being, um, um, in, in putting uh, an emphasis on innovation on new measures and so on. And, and that's a very good thing because uh, as for example, uh, Ms. Schramböck pointed out, we, we have to do some investment in Europe and you will have in the next session a focus on this as well. But on the other hand, um, you have to have clear cut binding rules defining barriers, limits to that. To be honest, in the practical, political, and economic policy discussion, uh, we always uh, spend very much time on assessing if some limits hold or not. If we're within narrow limits by percentage points or, or fractions of percentage points, and sometimes uh, I think we miss the main point on that. Binding rules should make sure, as they were formulated in the uh, Maastricht Treaty, for example, they should make sure that uh, over the business cycle we have some sustainability and uh, balanced budgets. So the question we incur is um, what are the main challenges in the current fiscal, fiscal framework uh, to make it more effective and to strengthen this framework? So what I present is no criticism on having those rules. I think most of them are, are very effective and, and uh, have been improved over the last years, but there is still room for getting even more effective. One of the problems is the calculation of the potential output. So aside from the academic discussion, I'm always in, but um, going to your daily business, that means you have to stick to some uh, limits, to some indicators, um, and in many cases, you do not know how those indicators will be after data revisions the next year, for example. So that means um, if we try to get in some flexibility within the system uh, with um, corrected figures, with um, uh, deficits according to the business cycle and corrected by potential output, that means that we are not always as sharp on the point as we would like to be. Um, well, unfortunately, there's no better way um, correcting debt or deficit figures, um, but using the potential output figures of the economy. Um, but the problem is that data revisions are very frequent, and uh, so that means that uh, some kind of tolerance zones uh, always tend to be, yeah, a little bit arbitrary and not very clear-cut. 
So the complex and partly inconsistent rules, um, there is some discussion if uh, it might not be advantages to uh, focus more on more, more simple figures. For example, um, debt to GDP ratios, deficit to GDP ratios without any corrections. Or what's even an interesting point, not as an alternative, but uh, we also have it uh, in the rules at the moment, to focus more on expenditure figures for short-term planning. And on the other hand, for long-term planning, um, well, still look at uh, all the figures we define in the two-pack, six-pack, the fiscal compact, and so on. Um, is a common fiscal capacity uh, an instrument, appropriate and viable instrument for deepening the European Monetary Union? I'm sure it is. But um, the discussion on the common fiscal capacity should be separated from the discussion on um, fiscal sustainability and the uh, stability and growth pact, I suppose. Because um, it makes sense to have offensive measures concerning um, innovation, concerning uh, the development of the economy, to stabilize output, for example, uh, and to support monetary policy uh, and fiscal policy, you have to take into account that after uh, having given the European monetary policy to the community level for stabilization instruments, there is tax policy and there is expenditure policy. So fiscal policy is the part you can use for stabilization. So it's always hard to find the correct balance between, on the one hand, uh, being consistent and coordinated within the rules, and on the other hand, to be very specific, country-specific, to have the discretion of the national governments and the national, national parliaments uh, in implementing fiscal policies. So um, what we see is that distributional effects should be taken into account when talking about the uh, fiscal capacity. So you would have to uh, find ways and measures on how is it financed, what are the binding rules, when can it be used? If you have to stick to the uh, rules of the, uh, to, to the fiscal rules, then there might be a chance that uh, those who need the capacity could, be come, sh could, could come short of, of, of um, the possibilities to use this capacity. So I think it's more a political discussion you have to conduct uh, rather than uh, an economic discussion because it's always about distribution among uh, the member states. Uh, so I think the, the most important thing would be uh, to define projects um, improving sustainability on the long run, so improving GDP growth path, uh, to have very clear-cut rules on that, and on the other hand, um, within those rules, to give the maximum discretion to the member states in order to uh, be very specific on the projects which could be financed by this uh, common capacity. Simplification is the third topic I would like to tackle. Simplification, effectiveness, and flexibility. Um, I think from uh, the planning point of view, as I pointed out, emphasis should be given on expenditure rules, and uh, we should be very careful on data revisions. So. That means there should be a change of culture when trying to complain with fiscal rules. I think most of the member states, as far as I uh, have been told and have um, uh, observed that, most of the member states always try to stick exactly within the limits. But that means if, you have, if, if you're sailing, for example, and you have a compass and you know it's not exact yeah, in, in, in some kind of the readings of the direction you go, and that's, that's the case with the indicators we have. You have to um, allow for that. So you have to, to fix the objectives uh, in a manner that uh, there is still room left if there are data revisions, if th something changes, uh, if some of the figures uh, will not be uh, the same calculation basis as you supposed uh, one year ago. So. That's a point, a, a small point, against only relying on figures with cyclical corrections. Yeah, so I think a mixture of both will be very important for the future. 
Um, if we simplify, uh, there is uh, something we have to deal with. It's investment. There is a huge discussion, and as you see, I want to bring more questions to you than answers, but I think that's also important for such a conference, for such a high-ranking conference. Um, investment, there has been a broad discussion on, on how to take into account investment uh, with a golden rule, for example, or other measures. Uh, I would say it's important that, uh, well, from my point of view, no classic classical golden rule should be uh, implemented in the future, but that we should take into account the dynamic structure of investment. So, uh, like businesses, there is uh, some accounting for depreciation over the years, and uh, that would make much more sense to take into account uh, when meeting uh, the rules. So, um, Another point I want to mention in this context is, you know we had, uh, in the past years, we had some uh, extraordinary effects which uh, were taken into account when calculating the limits. And I think uh, in um, a sense of transparency and in a sense of, of a very uh, clear-cut and explicit um, um, showing the, the correct fiscal stance, it would be better not to deduct any extraordinary expenditures from the figures, but to correct the limits and to allow for other limits. Because if we uh, try to uh, pretend that some expenditures uh, have not uh, been incurred, that's not uh, how this world works. Um, we had expenditure, but we had a political agreement in uh, not to taking into account those kinds of expenditure. Well, so after, after talking about some very hot topics, I will be a little bit um, softer in the fourth topic and uh, try to come to an end. Uh, the role of the national parliaments. Well, I think uh, for some of the countries, especially Austria, it's very important that the national parliaments are uh, try to set uh, a framework for the sub-national fiscal entities as well on the whole national level, uh, that there uh, is a increased and increased transparency of fiscal effects of all legislation. I know that uh, nearly all parliaments are going into that direction, but there is uh, also, it, it would be very um, advantages to have some improvement in that case. And uh, the national um, governments uh, could um, increase their monitoring and supervisory powers and strengthen those powers in the context by uh, being more explicit and uh, by forcing publication of um, uh, issues concerning uh, fiscal stance and uh, financial stability, for example, in implementing the comply or explain principle, especially uh, uh, concerning the analysis of the watchdogs, the in independent fis fiscal institutions. And um, what I think is very important for parliaments, and um, perhaps that's, that's a, a, a funny aspect for you as well, when I prepared for the invitation of that conference, my son always read interplanetary conference, and I told him, well, it's, it's, it's very important, but it's not interplanetary, it's, it's just our planet, and uh, it's, it's uh, also the European part of the planet. Uh, I think we should not forget that um, with all the coordination, it's important to coordinate, it's important to have clear and level plain playing fields, it's, it's very important to have uh, a well-defined well set of rules, but within those rules, we should try to maximize uh, the discretionary uh, room and space of the national parliaments and the national governments, uh, because, um, well, it's uh, one of the main points of the European Union to be very specific on the different levels of government and uh, to have the competence on those levels who have the competence best. Well, thank you very much for listening to those points of input, and I'm looking forward to a very hot and interesting discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Haber, for your presentation.
I would now like to ask my co-chair, Otmar Karas, member of the European Parliament, to take the floor. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I too would like to welcome you on behalf of the members of the European Parliament and our staff on the occasion of the sixth interparliamentary conference in Vienna. And I thank my Austrian colleagues for having organized the meeting and for having invited me. We heard two practice-related scientific presentations. I'd like to add a few words to these and introduce uh, the discussion. Ten years ago, we were hit by the financial crisis and we were confronted with an unprecedented challenge. It was the biggest financial, economic, and social crisis since the Second World War. We had an enormous crisis to cope with. In some countries, the crisis was worse than in others. But nevertheless, the euro today is stronger than it was in 2008. Our response to the crisis were more than 40 measures adopted together. That was a shared success. The European economy is growing at a rate of 2% faster than before the crisis. Unemployment in the European Union is at its lowest level um, in eight years, but still not low enough. All uh, countries, uh, including Greece, uh, uh, Prime Minister Tsipras uh, visited the European Parliament last week. All these countries, including Greece, uh, were able uh, to uh, no longer participate in the deficit uh, country, uh, in the deficit procedure. Only Portugal is the country left. In 2008, it was 24 countries. We expect that public deficits will go down further. And uh, I'm quite frank, 10 years ago, we were just not ready. We were not prepared. Neither politically, nor economically, nor in budgetary terms, we didn't have the necessary instruments at European level. That was difficult for us. It cost us time, and it led to cases of hardship in implementation. All that shows that we can do it if we address the most difficult task together and if there is a shared political will and if we do not use different uh, jurisdictions and different powers as a pretext when it comes to shared economic challenges. But uh, economic and monetary union has not yet been completed. We have not yet consistently uh, learned our lessons. It would be a fallacy uh, to think that we can go back to normal because Greece no longer needs to be bailed out. It's an important lesson which we have to learn. Misguided developments, fiscal developments, have to be uh, prevented and stopped in due time. We need discipline in the market. We need clear rules and requirements for um, fiscal and budgetary mon monitoring. For closer coordination, we have six-pack. Uh, we have the Euro Plus Pact and the Fiscal Compact. All these instruments under the he uh, con converge under the heading of the European semester. 
our own these are our economic policy coordination instruments and this takes me to a problem a common currency needs a common budget a common um, economic policy a common tax policy and a common shared political will Therefore, the coordination instrument of the European semester is so important for us to meet our monetary policy targets. The European semester provides us with an opportunity to put our finger on the spot and to address the actions that need to be taken. But there is a contradiction between deeds and targets, between analysis and reality. This contradiction is still clearly visible. A couple of figures. The member states between 2012 and 2017 in, on average, only implemented 53% of the country's specific recommendations. The implementation of reforms and an increase in investments could mean an additional percentage point of growth, which we need. Completing uh, the internal market uh, could generate an additional 3% of growth. So there is untapped potential. Uh, we can do better, but the recommendations that are made have to be implemented at national level. And this is something we have all committed to. Against this background, I would like to contribute four ideas. First, the European semester and its implementation have to be further improved together. A common currency needs a common uh, monetary policy framework, and we should make sure that the European semester is less complex, less complicated, but that it's interpreted as something that is binding. And we need adequate sanctions to be imposed on those who do not comply with what was decided together. Second, interparliamentary cooperation at technical level between the parliamentary administrations, not just between politicians, has to be intensified at national and European level. A recent study by the European Parliament showed that the involvement of national parliaments in the European semester varies greatly. And knowledge about the uh, European semester is not equally well developed in all administrations, and this weakens implementation of country specific. Uh, uh, recommendations. I would suggest that in parallel with Article 13 conferences, the committees and the committee secretariats of parliaments meet to discuss these matters. Third, we have to make everyone aware of the fact that the European semester does not replace the necessary deepening of uh, um, monetary union. A common currency can only work if it is based on a common budget, investment, social, and fiscal policy. The implementation of the banking union, the fiscal union, the conversion of the European stability mechanism into a European monetary fund, all that is urgently needed. Fourth, and this is my final point, all intergovernmental solutions which 
during the crisis because of the urgency that prevailed then were uh, developed, such as the ESM, the fiscal rules, and the Troika regime. All that should be converted into union law so that everything can be decided on the basis of uh, community law in the future. These ideas are nothing new. It has all been written down, and as a rule, at council level and at EP level, commitments have already been made, but we are lagging behind in implementing our commitments, our recommendations and proposals. And for the time being, we are blocking implementation because of uh, um, the fact that uh, the competences and powers are not in balance. In 1970, half a century ago, the Lux Luxembourg uh, Prime Minister uh, proposed a step-by-step -step plan saying that all measures for the completion of the monetary union can be taken within 10 years if the member states are willing. And at that time, it, what mattered most was political will, and what matters today is political will, eight months uh, before the elections uh, to the European Parliament. And we, together in this room, can make sure that the political will exists. And I would ask you for your support in this effort, and I wish you a successful meeting. Otmar Karas, thank you very much uh, for your statement. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we can now enter into our debate. I close the list of speakers for the first session, and I ask the first speaker to take the floor, uh, Margarida Marquez. And I hope you are aware of the three-minute uh, limit. I hope I don't need to use the bell to remind you of that. Thank you very much, Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank the presidency for organizing this interparliamentary conference. And I would like to speak on three things. First of all, convergence, that is an ambition of the European Union. But a budgetary convergence can, uh, is not the same thing as economic and social divergence. And the experience that we've made in uh, various countries of the EU with the uh, budgetary control programs, as for Portugal, the implementation of programs has pr really provoked great economic and social divergency. But then this is uh, a formal question, but also political question. We have a fiscal compact for budgetary policy, but what we do not have is an instrument that is strong enough for social politics. And this is why, in parallel with the budgetary consolidation strategy, we should also have um, investment, a very strong investment strategy that incorporates a social dimension for the implementation of the social pillar of the European Union. The social pillar adopted in Gothenburg cannot be just an element that is decorative, an ornament, but it has to be an integral part of European policies. Second point, the question of governance of the economic and monetary union. Mr. Tigerson all has already drawn our attention on the transparency problem. It is quite obvious that we need to find a democratic go governance mechanism that um, appreciates the role of national parliaments and that reduces, um, underpins their role. 
it is important to share the positions to to um, spurn the debate, but we also have to find instruments in order to increase the involvement of national parliaments. And then finally, when it comes to the debate on the euro, um, and this question was taken up by Juncker on, in his speech on the State of the Union, here we, we have to find measures um, more than just completing the economic, economic and monetary union in order to make sure that the Europe plays a really international role. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Mr. Nierfot Pitu. Thank you. I come from Cyprus, uh, a country that in 2013 had faced a fiscal and a banking crisis at the same time. And we pay a heavy cost also of the lack of the right architecture in the Eurozone. But we never complained. Even though many had predicted the collapse of our economy, five years after the big crisis, uh, we put our public finance in order. We cut expenditures without increasing taxes. We took Tough measures for the depositors. Cyprus was the only country that the bail-in on deposit had been imposed. Today, Cyprus is run with a growth of 4%, one of the highest in Eurozone and double the average growth of Europe. Our unemployment from 18% is now down to 7% less than the average in Europe. We run a budget of surplus 3%. We learn our lesson. And uh, something that we can share with our colleagues, once we face the problem, we don't have time to spend complaining or finding excuses. We have to move and act quickly, the soonest. At the same time, we have to admit that we introduced the euro as a strange currency, with only monetary policy to be common, and with 15 or 16 different fiscal policies. We had took right measures the last few years, but it's a challenge for the Eurozone to move forward to create the European Monetary Fund. It's a pity for Europe and Eurozone every time that we face a crisis to call the International Monetary Fund. We can put the right architecture for our home as Europeans. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mr. Michael Theurer. Chairman, colleagues, Otmar Karas has pointed out that the situation in the euro area has improved greatly. We do have growth, but Professor Tiggerson also warned that in some countries, the leeways that um, exist are not really utilized in order to increase fiscal stability but that uh, an expensive fiscal stance is being pursued um, un uh, contrary to the fiscal board recommendations. I think we have to remember that when the, the f f monetary union depends on the member states being responsible with their budgetary policy, I think we really have to underline this responsibility because we as member states and as national parliaments um, really call for um, decision-making powers when it comes to points that we uh, want to decide. The Nikolaus package, uh, the fiscal um, treaty, um, let me ask whether this is really a priority issue. Is 
more important than putting this at the European level is that the member states take ownership of all the rules and fill them with life. We believe that the further development of the ESM to a European monetary fund um, is the right decision, but this must not lead to a situation where the stability-oriented rules are eroded and undermined. When returning to the growth path in Europe, it's not public spending that is the decisive factor, but regaining trust by the Europe through the European semester and binding rules. And also the completion of the um, internal market and the question of competitiveness and um, the corresponding structure, structural reforms that were uh, conducted in reform countries. And the last issue on the Eurozone budget, yes, in financing the European budget, uh, we have a principle of um, performance. Big GDP countries uh, contribute more, and if there is stronger growth, you also have stronger growth for, to finance. On the other hand, in the structural funds, we have a distribution component. The funds of the um, structural funds go to those regions that have a lower GDP. And this, so this incorporates a distributive element. This is important and it's necessary in order to keep the European Union together. So before we talk about new funding instruments, I am convinced we should talk about how, in the framework of the existing possibilities of the EU budget, um, better spending can be made in order to eliminate uh, growth deficits, to stabilize the growth path in order to um, improve the social situation. Thank you very much. Ines Domingos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, I would like to thank as well the speakers of this conference. It was very interesting to hear all those technical details that are very important, of course, for these policies. And I would like to start by saying that it is important to recognize that the EU has taken important steps uh, to strengthen the fiscal framework that did help pave the way for the recovery in the EU, so that is important. But it is also true that there are some elements missing, and I would like to talk about one of those, which is the completion of the banking union. It was briefly referred in Mr. Kara's speech, and I thank him for this. Uh, the banking union is crucial in our view uh, for the reform of the EU fiscal governance because it, um, it is the way to separate the risk between the financial sector and the sovereign. Um, and so it is crucial in our view uh, that the banking union goes ahead. Now, economically, as the situation stands, without a deposit uh, insurance scheme, the market will remain fragmented. And that, from an economic standpoint, is not um, helpful. So we should uh, change that. From a political perspective, it is also fundamental for, for showing uh, European citizens that the EU is determined to make the financial system uh, more secure and also to avoid uh, contagion risks for the sovereigns. Uh, this is why uh, my party, f which is um, part of the EPP group, we urge European leaders to pursue very strongly uh, the completion of the banking union, particularly uh, actual, dealing very quickly with the legacy issues, but more importantly, to implement actually the deposit insurance scheme and especially actually agreeing on a calendar that um, that we, uh, an implementation calendar that everybody could agree on and we could get uh, going with that policy which we think is crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Here. Thank you. Mr. Igor Spimanovsk. No, it's ready. Good afternoon. Uh, about strengthening of a fiscal policy framework, uh, the lessons of the austerity should be taken into consideration and not forgotten still. It is the implementation of the fiscal compact that was harmful for the development of the member states as it impeded the public investments. It was also based on false assumptions as it was not prodigality of states that caused the crisis, but the debt of the private sector indeed. <laughs> 
National economies need public investments in order to raise internal demand. For private investments to come, the public ones should be provided first as the private investments follow the demand. In any case, to ensure it's necessary that the control of budget deficit need be combined with the use of mechanism of flexibility admitted in the Stability and Growth Pact. It is the flexibility of it which gives space to invest more. If the integration of the fiscal compact into EU legal framework happens, as the Article 16 of the treaty stipulates it, significant revisions have to be implemented in it. First, the calculation of potential growth and thus of this structural deficit should be based on a considerably longer time gap than the two years, which is used now. And second, the flexibility of the Stability and Growth Pact should be extended in particular by exempting national co-financing of EU structural and investment funds programs from deficit calculations. In my opinion, it's very important. I would like to hear the comments of the reporters. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Molto. Thank you. Um, my name is Anne Muller. I'm uh, not a vrouw, but I'm a man. I'm sorry. <laughs> First, if we... <laughs> Verzeihung. <laughs> Very sorry. We discuss uh, common fiscal capacity. We should ask the question, which problem do we want to solve? And if we look at uh, the shocks in the European Union, then we can see that 85% of the shocks hit all Eurozone member states. So the justification for a common fiscal capacity is very weak. What you should do in order to uh, observe shocks is a couple of things. First, we should complete, as said by our Portuguese colleague, the banking union and also the capital markets union. Second, a country is able to absorb shocks if it is competitive. So countries need to reform their economies. And thirdly, we can create 19 absor absorption capacities if countries commit themselves to the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. Then we have, instead of one fiscal capacity, we do have 19 fiscal capacities. So we don't need a common fiscal capacity. Then one mark remark about the Stability and Growth Pact. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Yeah? If, if countries violate uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, we have the European Commission, which calls itself a political commission, which says uh, France is France. So instead of a political commission, we need an independent guardian of the treaties. So that means also to get rid of the so-called Spitzenkandidat in order to have a neutral commission. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. Olavi Alanisile. Uh, Chairman, thank you, and uh, thank you for organizing this seminar. I would like to ask uh, about timing of, of economic policies now when good times are still here in Europe. As we know, structural reforms are needed in economies of member states. I mean, uh, structural reforms in labor market, in social health care system, and in taxation. Uh, these are needed to improve employment, rate of employment, uh, and to stabilize further public finances and to have better competitiveness. Maybe we can say that the uh, European Central Bank has already done it's part of the work. So, I, I agree that now in good times of economy, it's good time to do more in member states. So, the question is how can we encourage member states to do more when good times are here? Or the question is how can we, as a member of parliament, to do more in, in this respect? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Paolo Sa.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Within the framework of the European process of, of monetary integration, successive constraints and limitations have been imposed upon member states in the elaboration of the national budgets. These constraints and limitations aim to condition the sovereign choice of member states and impose a single neoliberal mindset favoring the accumulation of capital, the reduction of labor rights, and the weakening of the social state. Portugal has been strongly hurt by these budgetary restrictions. From 2011 to 2014, Portugal was subject to the so-called program of economic and financial assistance, which was a disaster leading to an economic and social regression without parallel in the country's recent history. After the parliamentary elections of 2015, there was a process of repealing the infamous measures imposed by the Troika. Wage and pension, pension cuts were eliminated, the national minimum wage was increased, the reduction of public administration workers was stopped, privatizations were reverted, and tax, taxes upon work incomes were reduced, among many other measures. As a result, the Portuguese economy started increasing, unemployment decreased, and living conditions improved. This policy must go on, but in its way, stands the European Union rules of the Stability and Growth Pact and the Treaty of Stability, Coordination and Governance, which hinder economic and social development and the resolution of the structural problems that affect our society. Therefore, my party, the Portuguese Communist Party, understands it is necessary to establish the objective of dissolving the economic and monetary union and revoke the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance in a prepared and organized process which should include compensatory and transitory measures for a new reality free from the single currency. Faced with the contradictions, impasses and problems created by the single currency, this is the solution and not an escape forward as some defense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Maria Joao Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Um, my comment to the panel is the following. Yes, indeed, we are starting to have recovery and more sustainable public finances. Um, and on the other hand, many problems are still there. And we cannot have complacency. I must say that uh, when it comes to the four points proposed by uh, my colleague Otmar Karas, I agree with them. They should be part of the conclusions of this conference. But now let me focus on a critical point which we must address in our interparliamentary work. Europe still has a huge underinvestment. And this is particularly worrying when we know that we need to conduct a transition to low carbon energy and when we know that we need to make the best of the digital revolution and prepare people for this. This means a huge investment. And we are struggling with our national budgets to have the means to underpin this investment. So something is missing. And what is missing? What is missing is a proper fiscal capacity in the Eurozone. All monetary zones in the world do have a budget. It's not possible to think that we are sustainable on the long term without having this proper budget. So this needs to be created. This is foreseen to be addressed in upcoming Eurozone summits in December, meaning under Austrian presidency, and we count on Austrian uh, presidency to be up to the historical responsibility. The solutions are well known. We have detailed proposals coming from the European Commission. We had a recent Mazenberg summit showing some political will. Now we need to uh, have the final push, and this should come from the Austrian presidency. Thank you, Thank you, Hans Michelbach. Ladies and gentlemen, compliance with the fiscal policy framework 
with um, all agreements on stability and growth, the Stability and Growth Pact and the Intergovernmental Fiscal Treaty is, of course, one of the great challenges in the European Union and for every individual member state. And there is no doubt that uh, economic um, successes have been reaped. We've heard that in the presentations. But let me add, there is also new debt. And in the financial market, risks are unfortunately on the rise. And um, sovereign bonds are still um, financed in, in the banks without um, equity underpinning. And I think that in the reforms and in compliance with the Maastricht rules, um, we must not um, forget about um, our efforts. And fiscal um, conferences have always generated the positive impetus for such um, efforts. Now, when we want to deepen our union with the ESM reform and the banking union, there is a next step ahead that can only be done successfully, um, could, uh, should only be done with the credibility of the national parliaments. This is a decision-making process and exchanges on the um, uniform um, fund which should be part of the stability mechanism. Of course, this means another fiscal challenge, and the um, reform should provide answers to the questions as to what are the fiscal policy aspects, Qu questions of um, debt capacities, risk um, decreases, roadmap for the um, um, deposit insurance scheme, those are the questions that the citizens of Europe ask. And the ECB um, pronounced itself for progress in uh, those um, measures without, however, clear progress in the area of risk reductions. I think um, this last step is unacceptable. I think it is indispensable that a gradual a procedure um, taking into account constitutional rules of the national um, member states, including the national parliaments, is necessary. National parliaments need to be, um, the, the rights of national parliaments need to be preserved. Probably an adjustment of the intergovernmental agreement on um, deposit um, schemes is um, necessary. And we believe otherwise, um, it would be very problematic. Thank you very much. Thank you, schön. Herr Dimitrios Thank you, Mr. Dimitrios Mardas. Dear President, I would like to ask from a, a very simple question that all of us knows. How we reduce the excessive budget deficit or the double deficit in the case that we have current account deficit? It is well known that to reduce public expenditures, we apply austerity policies through the reduction of wages, and uh, all these lead to the reduction of the GDP. How we can cure this negative trend? referring to the reduction of GDP, we try to increase investments and exports. In this case, we have to apply mechanism, mechanisms in favor of increasing investments and exports. This means that we need liquidity. We need liquidity. Of course, we have in our mind the banking union. However, we have to pay attention to this issue because if the Commission, following the common rules, want to punish and gime the punishment, any government because of any excessive budget deficit,
this must not lead to the punishment of the market. This means that you have to work on that. It means that you have to work on the fact that you have to find mechanisms increasing liquidity in favor of the market. This can counterbalance the decrease of GDP, which is the result of the trends which lead to the decrease of public expenditures and austerity policy. This is very important for the market because we need recovery in the short run and not in the medium and the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shen. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Jamila Madera is the next speaker. Thank you for the organization of this conference. Uh, it's something that you need to debate, is that uh, you need real convergence instruments to, uh, to ensure that it is, uh, these instruments allow uh, accountability, but also uh, uh, convergence of quality of life for the people. That means that we have the responsibility as members of the most of us of the budget committees to put the budget service uh, serving the people. And that means that the fiscal compact, it's a contribute, it's a, an, an instrument to that conversion to serve the people because it allows stability and it allows regaining trust and it's a way, it's a way to the next step. But the next step should have been uh, more um, uh, our great goal, which is to have a, a true budget and own resources. You cannot keep the, the track like this and, and have the idea of having an investment plan if it, don't, if it doesn't have its own budget and its own resources serving to serve the people because we cannot be hostage of 1% revenue uh, and, and uh, intend to build a Europe based on these resources. We cannot support the people and the social pillar based on 1% revenue. To have this investment plan, to have this goal to serve the people, we have to uh, deliver with the new bud with the, with the budget and uh, this own resources strategy and not doing like we are doing today, which is cutting from the MFF or the next MFF to gain the resources to have this goal because we are lacking behind what we are doing right and, uh, and, and sh uh, short going on, a, on this investment plan, which is already too short for the goals that we intend, that is to keep the economic growth, but also to be put on the table a big push on the social, uh, on the social pillar. So what we need is to deliver, and to deliver a budget, own resources, and a social pillar that really ensures the people that we are going in the good way. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Georgios Kirtsos is the next speaker. Thank you, President. I believe that we have reached the state of uh, more or less fiscal equilibrium, and this is a big success for the European Union. I also believe that uh, conditions have changed for various reasons that I'll try to explain, and we need a mildly expansionary fiscal policy. First of all, uh, the monetary policy that has been applied helped us a lot, but it is bound to become less accommodating in the future, so we have to find ways or uh, of compensating for that factor in terms of the overall economic policy that we follow. Second, our competitors, I believe you can correct me on this, the United States of America and China, and we should add the United Kingdom as well, uh, because from a member of the EU will become a, a competitor. They follow, in my view, a looser fiscal policy. So they can finance their projects, they can finance their policies, uh, whatever they wish to do, uh, in an easier way. Third, we, we should give emphasis on the quality of the policies that we follow and the policy mix, because we keep setting goals that then we abandon, more or less, for lack of money uh, financing. For instance, uh, public investment. Italy is in trouble, even in Germany has 
some kind of problems. We should spend more, we keep saying we should spend more on the digital economy and digital infrastructure because the Americans and the Chinese are becoming dominant. But we cannot finance our effort. Then we keep promising to our American allies uh, that we'll increase defense spending or otherwise we'll face a crisis, a transatlantic crisis. But nobody actually increases defense spending. So if you want to be uh, honest with ourselves and uh, try to do what we have promised, we should move in this direction. Finally, there is the Italian crisis, the Italian problem. I don't think we should uh, try to have an antagonism between Brussels and Italy. We should find a compromise because antagonism between Brussels and capital cities uh, usually end in crisis. Brexit, Poland, Hungary, uh, we cannot afford an, an Italian crisis, so we need some kind of understanding and some kind of compromise. And as a Greek MEP, I can tell you that if we have trouble in Italy, then trouble will come back in Greece, and that's why I underline the Italian factor. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Christos Staikouras. The European Union still faces major challenges, such as increased public debt, potential contraction of monetary policy, the demographic problem, internal and external security issues, Brexit, economic relations with other countries, the digital revolution, while especially Greece continues to be out of the markets, its growth gap with other member states has inflated and private debt has skyrocketed. The collective answer should be a more resilient, competitive and efficient Europe with enhanced solidarity, better economic coordination, adequate tools and resources to tackle imbalances, concrete rules for long-term economic governance. Thus, what is needed to achieve sustainable growth, create new jobs and strengthen social cohesion? First of all, the implementation of responsible fiscal policies, simplifying the existing complexity of fiscal rules, however, focusing on the cyclically adjusted structural budget balance as is defined in the fiscal compact. The adoption of realistic fiscal targets and the improvement of public finance composition with the reduction in tax burden and better expense control. The implementation of coherent, consistent, time-sequent and country-led reforms, as well as the execution of PIB at the national level that will improve, it will enhance structural competitiveness. The creation and efficient operation of independent institutions like the Fiscal Council to monitor compliance with fiscal rules incorporated into the medium-term fiscal strategy framework as it will be passed from national parliaments. The transformation of the ESM into a European Monetary Fund acting as a fiscal stabilization mechanism with sufficient lending and borrowing capacity and the possibility of developing new financial instruments. The finalization of the banking union by promoting the establishment and the operation of a European deposit insurance scheme with a mutual reinforcement of risk sharing and risk reduction since substantial risk reduction has already taken place. And finally, the development of a fully fledged capital market union providing deep and well integrated cross border funding to enhance liquidity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Elina Lepomeki. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. Um, we have been talking about the economic growth um, in, in Europe uh, picking up and, and, and taking pace, but uh, we, we must remember that this is obviously taking place uh, on the back of uh, very unprecedented um, quantitative easing and monetary policy. 
which has led to the fact that the ECB balance sheet is now at uh, almost 40% of, of European or Eurozone GDP and has doubled over the course of the past four years. Now, if there is no, mar and, and obviously this all has led to the fact that uh, there are no real market signals, and since there is no real market discipline, there hasn't been any incentive for governments to, to perform um, efficient economic policies and structural reforms that also um, we have been looking forward to and, and have been discussing today why we haven't used those um, time windows um, available. Now, we do need more functioning institutions, but um, I would also um, raise the point that we need to also realize that, for instance, the reason why the United States of America as, as a federal system works with uh, their own unified uh, or their single currencies is that they have much better functioning, not just the labor market, um, but capital markets and, and the involvement of the private sector. In fact, looking at um, research, it shows that uh, the contribution of, of private flows of capital um, in, in periods of crisis has a much larger effect on macroeconomic stabilization than, than any federal level transfers, uh, sorry, transfers. So I think we need to speak more about the functioning capital markets and, and also um, what the role of, of um, the monetary policy will be in the future, realizing obviously that us as parliamentarians wouldn't have any, any uh, influence on that. Um, but we need to take into account that the, that the sort of the crowding out effect of, uh, of um, direct and indirect um, central bank involvement in the markets um, does take the incentive for, for structural reforms away. And also I think we need more talk about a social Europe where the European Union concentrates more on uh, giving people the right incentives and also the possibilities to not just work, but also, um, um, uh, well, well, participate in a constructive way in, in entrepreneurship and uh, innovations. Thank you, Frau Kollegin. Thank you very much. We have arrived at the end of our list of speakers, and I would uh, now ask uh, the three panelists to reply, and uh, I would like to give the floor to Otmar Karas. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been attending uh, the Article 13 conference uh, since uh, 2013. I don't know how you feel, but uh, I must say this has been one of the most positive and least controversial discussions, very factual and non-controversial. The climate which I observe in this room is the prerequisite for us to reach our shared goals, although our approaches are different. Only then will we be able to find a European response to emerging nationalism and populism. I think this was a great reaction. I can endorse uh, most of what has been said. Uh, the statements made complemented each other. We heard about different experiences, different approaches, but not a single speaker put the shared objectives into question. As regards the social dimension or the social pillar, I would like to say the following. In crisis management, this played an important role. In the European Union, through the intergovernmental approach of the stability mechanism, throughout the programming period, we were told that the charter of fundamental rights and the social rights uh, 
should not be taken into consideration in the evaluation of the programs because the catalog of measures is intergovernmental. Everyone took note of that, particularly the nation states. They said, well, this is not for Europe to decide because um, money comes uh, from the individual member states, and it was only at the end of the discussion through a ruling by the Court of Justice of the European Union which confirmed that the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Social Fundamental Rights, which are enshrined more strongly in the Charter of Fundamental Rights than in many national constitutions, should have been the foundation for for the national programs. Uh, Gothenburg was referred to as well as the social pillar. The European Union does not have enough powers in the social sphere. We have a mismatch between uh, powers in the field of competition, in the field of currency, and social minimum standards. But in the majority of member states, uh, Numerous political parties are addressing the question of the social pillar as an instrument of internal power politics, and too little reference is made to uh, the balance between social challenges and the social realities. Take a look of the, at the reactions of the member states uh, to the um, budget of the European Union. They're always saying no, no, no to increases, and this might lead to a reduction in funding for cohesion policy, which is a social component. So we're all in the same boat in this question as well. And we have to fight for it that uh, this mismatch of competences is not abused by populists. We have to change the framework. We have to make sure that the Gothenburg process for the social pillar continues. And I'd like to point out that with the European semester, we made sure that in the assessment of the implementation of the European semester, not just economic parameters, but also unemployment figures, social uh, dimensions, and investments are taken into account, as well as expenses for integration policy. Part of the reform of the Europe European semester has a social dimension, and I think we should uh, refer to that in our assessment. When it comes to national rights, I do understand that some national parliaments say that uh, national parliaments, national rights have to be upheld when the ESM is transformed into a European monetary fund. Currently, the ESM is an intergovernmental facility, and therefore it requires unanimity of the ministers of finance of the euro area. This caused enormous problems during the crisis because it slowed us down, and what is lacking is national control and European European control or monitoring. If the ESM is put on a community basis, the parliamentary oversight function will be implemented very clearly, and it will reduce the monitoring uh, it will not reduce the rights of national parliaments to exercise their oversight function because for parliamentary oversight of the governments of the member states, national parliaments are responsible. So if the national governments are involved, the national parliaments will also be involved. A question about deficit. There is a study by the LAMI Working Party which 
stated, and that corresponds to numerous comments made, that the biggest growth and employment effect in the European Union would be a doubling of the budget for research and development. And this is the reason why the Commission uh, demands uh, an increase uh, from 80 to 160 billion. Uh, Parliament asked for 120 billion, and I would ask for your support for that. And as regards own resources, this is an issue uh, contained in the treaties, but currently we are orienting our uh, debate uh, by the requests of the member states and not the requirements of the European Union. If we want innovation, investment, research, the social pillar, if we want all that, we need a parliamentary debate about what money is needed for and where that money can be found. What we can't raise through structural reform has to be raised through new expenditure. And for that, we need political consensus on own resources. This is not a new request because it's in the Treaty on European Union. And compliance with the rules is something we all want. Thank you very much, Professor Haber. I think I also saw the consensus on uh, that sustainability and fiscal stability are important uh, and are the basis for being ready for the future. Uh, and on the other hand, I, I think it's also widespread consensus that investment in innovation, in common infrastructure and in social cohesion is also important. So that's uh, not uh, two different things, but basically the same thing. And uh, we know that growth is fine at the moment. Uh, we, we see that growth will be fine the next years, hopefully as well, but there will be times where we need some reserves and some potential to uh, take investment in, in the then change future as well. So I think what, what we saw here is that uh, clear rules and strict rules, which, which are strictly obeyed and which are simple and understandable, are the best um, basis for having a maximum of discretion on the parliamentary levels, both on, on the European parliamentary level and on the national parliamentary level. So I just want to emphasize that um, uh, putting clear competencies, for example, for the European Monetary Fund uh, to the correct institution means that uh, you still maintain uh, accountability, that you maintain parliamentary um, uh, control and checks and, and responsibilities, and that uh, in that sense, clear rules maximize also the room and the space for discretion uh, within those rules. So that's, uh, I think, what I can take from this session. Thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you, John. Uh, Professor Tigerson. Thank you very much, Professor Tigerson. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I certainly share the view of Mr. Karas that this was a very useful and impressive uh, discussion. Fifteen speakers, I noted from the floor, uh, spoke about the issues, um, and uh, many of them, of course, uh, went much beyond what uh, Professor Harbour and I intimated in our introduction. But I sympathise with that. Um, I'm old enough to have taken part in debates in the European Union since Denmark joined in uh, 1973. Uh, at that point, indeed, uh, when the crisis struck at that time, uh, the debate was, uh, should we give up monetary union and try to create some fiscal prerequisites for beginning this discussion? That was the view to which I subscribed initially. Uh, and when we had uh, a couple of years later, exactly 40 years ago, in fact, uh, <coughs> a report uh, on public finance in the uh, role of public finance in the European community as it was then, um, the so-called McDougall report concluded that a pre-federal budget of two to three percent would be the minimum to make a monetary union functional. Uh, now that uh, uh, report, although supported initially by the commission, uh, immediately ended the discussion because few governments were ready to discuss it. And when the United Kingdom uh, 
put down its uh, budget proposals in 1979, that discussion ended entirely and, and it has never quite come back. And not even uh, the idea that was also at this time a uh, prevalent one, that there was a need for a deficit financing mechanism at a time of severe external imbalances, uh, which was still incorporated in the plans that uh, Shiska de and Helmut Schmidt had for economic and, and for a European Monetary Fund, in fact, in 1980. That was not implemented because that was seen as too lax, uh, too unconditional. So in the end, uh, the European Union had to start from, in a sense, from the bottom again. And uh, the optimism in the 1980s was that by late 1980s, uh, European economies had become sufficiently converted that one could really assume again that monetary union would be the trigger that uh, put some of these other mechanisms into operation as well. And that was why the rules uh, that were set up at the time were seen as a very good compromise between uh, national and European views. Uh, rules are very suitable. They are permit a certain arm length uh, between uh, the European level and the, uh, the national level. National parliaments do not want to be told too many details, only when a country may be in extreme circumstances. So uh, uh, the rules were seen as necessary, and I think they still are seen as necessary, and, and rightly so in, in my own view but they uh, uh, took a particularly uh, restrictive form of focusing on, on debt sustainability uh, entirely. Uh, much later then, we have had uh, periods when the rules were not observed and when uh, sins were committed, uh, and I think some of the sins that we talk about uh, were committed well before the restrictions of, of the stability and growth pact have really been operational uh, in, in the case of some of the countries that have subsequently been programs. Uh, but I would nevertheless uh, want to remind those who were very critical of, of the uh, constraints that the uh, European rules have put on, or the adjustment programs even more have put on economies, that we have a list of success stories in the European Union. Uh, the speaker from Cyprus referred to his country. We see the three Baltic states, Ireland, exited their program uh, also uh, early and, and established growth. And uh, it's not least in some of these smaller peripheral economies that growth has uh, picked up and, and sustained uh, uh, the whole. Uh, so um, there are success stories uh, despite, you can say, uh, some of the rules. Now, the, the problem uh, with the rules is that um, I did not want to leave, I hope, the impression that uh, there's criticism of the Commission because it has been too flexible. Unbalanced since the crisis is also the view of the European Fiscal Board, which we expressed last year. Uh, it was necessary to apply uh, flexibility to a considerable extent. But the uh, counterpart to that is that uh, today, when we are getting into better times, uh, this flexibility is less needed and uh, should be, that should be seized as an opportunity to simplify and restructure them and uh, make it look less intrusive. Uh, I can understand why national parliamentarians find it difficult to debate the kind of very precise rules that are in the uh, stability and growth uh, framework. Um, a couple of, of more simple principles and one operational target would be enough. And we have in, in our forthcoming report, which we will present to the commission next month, uh, some uh, specific suggestions, and I do see and, and not only among outside observers. I do see some convergence of views in this direction, but that convergence has not yet reached the political level, and, and if you want to see reforms of uh, the uh, fiscal rules and the fiscal system as a whole, I think pressure has to come from uh, national parliaments as well. National parliaments, of course, have a major role, uh, although it's indirect and informal. And uh, I would have hoped that the decentralization of surveillance that has also taken place since the crisis, uh, particularly by setting up uh, national fiscal councils to check whether the information provided by governments is reasonable, to really assess the longer term growth prospects of an economy. Uh, whether that provides, must provide parliaments with a, an opportunity to discuss uh, in a critical way uh, with their own governments uh, the strategy. Uh, and also, uh, of course, the, how they fit into the European picture. But the balance between, there again, the national and the European uh, uh, efforts are, are not uh, yet in, uh, achieved, certainly not. Uh, I think the terminology of risk reduction and, and uh, 
uh, risk sharing, which is used in the banking union, is also appropriate in the fiscal area. Risk reduction is, of course, uh, following the national rules, more or less, uh, with a limited flexibility that should still be there. And risk sharing is the uh, recognition that after the crisis, we have learned that some shocks are simply too big to be dealt with only by national instruments and by a European Central Bank that has, as some people said, rightly done its own job. But uh, without some uh, effort at the central level, it's not really possible. And, and there the discussion is, is only at the very beginning. And it's important, as the last speaker said, of course, that in all these institutional designs, which may look desirable in themselves, that one doesn't undermine some of the elements of positive incentives that exist in the system before and uh, which exist at the national level. So my encouragement is uh, the national parliamentarians uh, take an interest also not only in your own government's policy, but in how they fit together and in these uh, European uh, issues, as does the European Parliament, obviously, by definition already, um, push for it and, and call in uh, policymakers. Uh, more often, uh, you don't, may not have uh, the right to, to see them, but I note that uh, the European Parliament has ex extended uh, hearings uh, with officials that were not initially supposed to appear there. And I do note that European policy officials also appear from time to time in, in national parliaments. That should be certainly used much more, and I encourage you to uh, go ahead in, in that route. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herr Professor. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our three panelists, Professor Tiggerson, Professor Haber, and Otmar Karas, not only for their contributions. Uh, I would like to thank not only the panelists, but all of you for your contributions uh, to the discussion. And thank you also for having been so disciplined in, disciplined in timekeeping. We are on schedule, absolutely on schedule. It's not up to me to comment on the debate, but following up what Otmar Karas said, um, I think the discussion has shown that committed and substantive debates on the basis of different political orientations can be constructive and solution-oriented. There is no conflict between these two issues, and I do hope that we're going to continue our meeting in this spirit.